guests and dear friends and colleagues. And it's always a pleasure to be with, with friends of uh, Wash and Peace. Um, so as Hila said, my name is Kelly Ann Naylor and I'm UNICEF's Associate Director for Water, Sanitation and Hygiene. Um, and I'm uh, greeting you this morning from New York City. Um, I'm very delighted to be among the participants of this important event today. And as Kilo said, um, some of us were part of the, the, the meeting that took place in December, and I was um, fortunate enough to be there last year. Um, and so I think this event now is coming very much at the right moment for us to be able to take that conversation um, forward. So just really first to extend our sincere thanks to the German WASH Network and the German Federal Foreign Office for organizing this event as part of the Global WASH Cluster Coordinated WASH Sector Roadmap Initiatives. Um, so really framing this conversation today, um, I think for many of us who are coming at this from a humanitarian angle, we know already that humanitarian crises over these last years have been more frequent, they've been affecting more people, and they've been lasting longer. Um, and I think as we've heard, we've also um, very much seen um, an increasing population of people living um, in what we consider to be fra fragile and conflict affected um, uh, settings. Um, today we estimate that around 1.8 billion people um, of which uh, 670 million are children um, live in these settings and this is already um, more than a third of the world's children population and I think what has struck me more um, about these settings as well it's about a quarter of the world's population um, and a third of the world's children population um, it's three home to three quarters of the world's extremely poor population and so um, when we look at this question of inequalities um, and how we are going to achieve um, the sustainable development agenda, um, we know that we must um, reach these areas, um, not only with humanitarian assistance, but to achieve the rights to water and sanitation for everyone, we must um, be able to bring sustainable development solutions. Um, and when we, um, together, many of you know that WHO and UNICEF um, lead the joint monitoring program, which looks at the data for the SDG targets 6.1 and 6.2. And when we did an analysis of this data, um, we found that um, people living in extremely fragile states were over eight times as likely to lack basic drinking water services as um, the global population. And when we look around progress Progress on uh, sanitation, only one in 10 countries was on track to achieve universal access to basic sanitation. And we actually found in nine countries, the access to sanitation was actually decreasing. So I think there is this incredible linkage between fulfilling our commitments to leaving no one behind with the sustainable development agenda that are going to require that we transition out of a humanitarian response cycle so that we can um, achieve these sustainable development solutions. And um, as Mr. Kohler said, um, there has been this drive um, from the UN Secretary General himself um, when he took office to bring together what we called um, the agenda for humanity and really looking at how humanitarian response, sustainable development and sustaining peace are really part of three sides of the same triangle. Um, and just um, from UNICEF perspective in 2019, we launched the Water Under Fire campaign to bring greater attention to this situation of water in conflict and affected and fragile settings, but also as a chance to share encouraging examples of how water can be part of this solution for the triple nexus. And we think that water is a tremendously important and high potential area to um, demonstrate how the triple nexus can um, be put into practice. And so I think that's just why I really wanted to emphasize 
the importance of today's event um, and particularly um, the outcome that we're aiming for with the joint implementation action plan that will guide our way forward. So it's really in this light that we are so fortunate to have um, this high level panel discussion that can help us really frame uh, this discussion on the humanitarian development and peace nexus for water sanitation and hygiene. Um, and today we have um, three really um, esteemed panel members um, who are going to help us really lead this discussion um, from, the, from, from different um, perspectives and angles. And um, I'm just going to introduce them now and then we will go to a question for each one. And then I hope if time permits, we'll be able to have kind of a, a final question um, for each of them. Um, so just the first panelist um, that I wanted to introduce is um, the Honorable uh, Dr. Danilo Turk, um, who is uh, currently the lead political advisor of the Geneva Water Hub. Um, and many of us um, know um, Dr. Turk's work as the chair of the UN high-level panel um, on water and peace um, and um, formerly the president um, of Slovenia. So, um, so that's Dr. Danilo Turk. So um, Dr. Turk and I was, um, I'm, I'm at home today, but I um, keep a copy um, of the um, report um, that came out from um, this important work that was done um, by the Global High Level Panel on Water and Peace um, called A Matter of, of, of Survival. Um, and I think, you know, for many of us um, who've been working in this sector, this is really the groundbreaking work um, that has linked together the risks um, of water in conflict settings um, and water itself as a source of conflict in kind of the chapters, um, uh, you know, Into the Abyss, uh, which I think many of us have read many times. Um, but also you've really set forward um, a positive vision um, of how water can be a driver of peace and stability um, through more effective um, local and um, international national cooperation. Um, so we really wanted to hear from you today, um, from your perspectives on what can be the role of um, the WASH sector, those of us who are convened here today, um, both on the humanitarian and development actors to contribute um, to the peace outcomes in um, fragile contexts. So that was sort of the first question. And then um, the second question was that we, you know, one of the outcomes of our workshop um, is going to be to develop a joint operational framework. So we want to really start implementing this um, uh, at the national and subnational level. And we wanted to get your advice um, on how we can link together um, the global campaigns and partnerships that can help us um, to lead this agenda and move it forward um, in support of country level efforts. So um, thanks very much, Dr. Turkin, over to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Kelly. and. Uh, Thank you in particular for doing the necessary advertising for our report, uh, um, which of course deliberately chose the title, A Matter of Survival, because water and sanitation is uh, essential for survival and the hum humankind is facing grave threats with regard to water. And we wanted to give a sufficiently dramatic title to that report which deals obviously with the questions of problems of water in armed conflicts, but also in peaceful situations, particularly fragile situations where policy related to water is essential for development. So in a way, our panel, which concluded its work back in 2017, um, uh, saw the triple nexus in a way, although we were not able to go into the to the organizational and conceptual details, but we are happy to see that this is now going further. We are very much encouraged by the UNICEF reports Water Under Fire, which has pointed to very serious problems in contemporary never-ending armed conflicts, and obviously to all the triple nexus activities which show the problems and the ways on, of dealing with them and also the way towards development and a more peaceful future. Now, your first question relates to the role of the WASH sector. 
And here I would like to say that that role is twofold. First, it uh, brings the much needed attention and focus into the water picture, because there is a lot of talk about water in general related to climate change and, and everything else. But this is the focus and that focus has to be kept. And secondly, it invites a kind of political pressure on the political leaders and also in, turn in armed conflicts on military leaders because it has precise focus and precise priority status. Now, as I was reading the documents which were prepared for the conference today and to, tomorrow, I was pleased to see that in the Sanitation and Water for All, the initiative Sanitation and Water for All, uh, um, uh, contains this partnership strategies, strategy which has put in the forefront the task of building and sustaining political will. I think it's very important to have this notion of political will in mind from, from the very beginning. You see, often the discussions about development or humanitarian assistance end up with the conclusion, all right, we can do this and that if there is political will. I think the, the, the whole thing has to be put in a different order. Political will has to be generated from start. And one of the instruments of doing that is WASH, because it brings to the focus the, the most essential, immediate, urgent things which cannot wait. So while political will is essential, it will never just emerge. It, it requires pressure, and that pressure can be strengthened and made focused by by WASH. Now, of course, um, when I speak about this, I'm fully aware that WASH is a priority and in a, in a way minimum, but not as a substitute for comprehensive water management. Uh, it is the minimum and the first priority. And this is obviously very important when you talk to the national leaders who have to take into account the whole range of issues of management of water uh, and water resources, and of course, many other policy issues. So that, that notion that this has to be given priority as the minimum is, is clearly necessary, but it has to be brought to the political level. Now, one thing is also important to say, I'm not suggesting that the task which I just kind of sketched out is an easy one. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm not, I'm not suggesting anything as, <laughs> as strange as that. It is a difficult one. It's a sensitive one. And it is particularly difficult and sensitive in those societies which we somewhat fashionably call fragile societies nowadays. And we have to be aware of the political sensitivity of the very terminology of fragile societies. And that is because fragility in itself is above all fragility of governance. That's where the core of the fragility is. It exists at all levels of state and extends to the local fabric. Fragility is expressed in the absence of essential services. That's very much the essence of fragility. And water is at the core of these services. So addressing fragility is really uh, kind of a very natural um, way of uh, approaching this problem. But then again, it has to be done with a full sense of the political nature of, of this approach. Now, water is basic for food security, health security, education, culture, as well as energy security. And all that, of course, has to be borne in mind when you talk to the political leaders. Now, of course, you know better than I do what it means to talk to political leaders in fragile societies. But then again, one would have to look at the big picture as well. And here I would like to refer to the current developments relating to the Sahel region in Africa. Water and uh, specifically the triple nexus in, in that geographic region is essential for both survival of people, but also for peace in the region and for development of the region and has to be managed in a way that strengthens the availability of water services and water uses for all. And that obviously requires a very good understanding of local circumstances, the local traditions, local culture, local structures of power and so forth. And it is critically important that policymakers in each of the countries 
take this uh, into account. Obviously, the activists of the triple nexus will have a hard work to do. But the Security Council has just recently, I think less than a month ago, adopted a comprehensive strategy for Sahel and West Africa. So I think it would be very important to figure out what does this comprehensiveness entail and where does WASH and Triple Nexus fit? This is the moment to do it. And this is the moment to talk to the highest rank of leaders, both in the international, at the international level and national. And to conclude on this subject, I would like to say just a few words about the uh, question of, milit of armed conflicts. Uh, now, obviously, in terms of an active armed conflict, Triple Nexus is something to be discussed with military commanders as well. And uh, there is never too much to, to remind them that uh, protection of water infrastructure and water resources in armed conflict is essential. It is essential for the survival of civilian populations and has to be pursued. Now, of course, many military commanders understand that. And, uh, you know, it is interesting that in many conflicts, kind of protection or at least non-attacking uh, uh, of uh, on, on, uh, on um, uh, water resources is practically respected, although not necessarily declared. So there, there, there is a very strong, you know, existential base for that. What I would like to emphasize is to have not only the existential understanding of the water, but also the necessary conceptual and legal framework for protection of resources and in particular infrastructure in armed conflict. This is not only because we have common sense, this is all also because we are all bound by certain norms. And that has to be, that has to be you know, brought to the, to the military and political leaders uh, very carefully and very, very strongly. Now, in the course of our conference, my colleague Mara Tignino from Geneva will explain in more detail how uh, this whole conceptual and legal framework is designed. Now, these are my comments on the first question. If you want me to proceed to the second question, now I'll do it gladly. Great, Danilo. Thank you very much. That was very, very comprehensive and, and I think really enlightening for us to, 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 to hear about that because I think many of us, you know, we see our work in very practical terms and in and, and terms of the services and the work that we do. But when we are working with communities and we're working with governments, it's very helpful to also be able to kind of understand these um, these uh, uh, different um, dimensions. So I think maybe I'm just looking a little bit at the at the time that we have. Um, so maybe what we'll do is we'll come uh, through the other um, panelists and then let's come back on that question at the end because I think it'll be great once we have the um, kind of the three perspectives. Maybe it's a question that we could all um, think about um, as kind of the the, the way forward. Um, so thank you um, for, for, for that, Dr. Turk. Um, and next, um, we're going to be moving to um, Katerina del Albuquerque. Um, and Katerina, um, many of us know, is um, the uh, CEO of the Sanitation and Water for All um, Partnership. And of course, um, as um, was already mentioned, Katerina also um, is in some ways, uh, I don't know, Katerina, can I say that you're the mother <laughs> of the, <laughs> the human rights to water and sanitation, but also through the work that she had done um, many of us know the work that she did as special rapporteur to really bring forward the formalization um, of the human rights um, to water and sanitation that many of us, um, you know, of course, refer to in our daily work. Um, so, Katarina, thank you um, so much um, for being uh, with us um, here, here today. Um, and so, you know, really, um, and many of us, you know, know, of course, the work of um, sanitation and water for, for all um, and the way that it's a, a multi-stakeholder partnership. And I think 
really building on um, Dr. Turk's comments about, you know, the, the role that this partnership has, um, I think both in the global space of building the political will, but also um, in the cooperation space in terms of um, really sharing um, experiences and um, building up um, best practices. Um, so what um, do you see um, as, as kind of the, the trend um, on being able to work together um, in this global space on um, both the immediate humanitarian response, but also um, long-term development settings? And what does this really mean for a global partnership um, like um, SWA? And um, I think we've mentioned that this is part of SWA's new 10-year strategy. So how do you really see the prospects of this partnership being able to contribute to the work on the triple nexus. Put you on the spot. <laughs> but it's not so early for you. You know, I've, I've been awake for many hours. Thanks so much, Kelly, and thanks for hiding, I don't know, five questions in one? Uh, <laughs> But um, to begin with, thank you so much. Thank you to you, Kelly, and of course to the organizers, uh, and of course to my fellow panelists um, and to all the participants. It's a pleasure and an honor to be uh, to be here. And the points made by Mr. Köhler, as well as the intervention by Professor Turk, made me think that things are really connected. So uh, Mr. Kurla's reference to the negotiations of the, the resolution of the UN General Assembly, recognizing explicitly, recognizing the rights to water and sanitation. And of course, I remember it as if it was uh, yesterday. And also the, the statement by uh, Professor Turk regarding the SWA strategy and the fact that we put political will at the forefront. And I must say that when I moved from being rapporteur to working for SWA, what drove me in working for SWA was that I thought that SWA could be the implementation arm of the UN General Assembly resolution that you, Mr. Köhler, referred to. And, and yes, and uh, uh, Professor Turk, uh, I remember very clear a conversation you and I had when I was reporter and I came on mission to Slovenia to analyze the situation of the access of the rights to water and sanitation in your country. And I remember very well the conversation we had, the questions that you asked me, I felt I must say in a, in a law exam, uh, about the elaboration, the importance of public policies on economic, social, and cultural rights, and also on the rights to water and sanitation, and also the importance of leaving uh, uh, no one behind. And uh, look, I think that the fact that the head of state receives and spends one hour with a special rapporteur is clearly a sign of the political will that you uh, were referring to uh, before. So our mission at SWA, as you were saying, Kelly, is to build a world or contribute to building a world through our partners, because we are a partnership, where the rights to water and sanitation are realized for all, for always and um, not for always, always and everywhere. And as, as has already been mentioned, we have to over two million, um, sorry, billion people living in humanitarian and fragile settings. And we also must work on solutions for those populations. Fragile settings are further exacerbated by a topic that uh, we are working hard this year, climate. And, uh, and if we do not succeed in tackling also the climate crisis, uh, the alarmingly high number of people living in crisis will undoubtedly become even higher. So in working towards our mission, and we place particular importance also on political will. And we know that this is, as the Germans like to say, the A and the O. I think they mean the alpha and the omega. I think that's what it, it's meant in German. It's the alpha and the, and the omega of making things work or failing to do so. And uh, of course, we also work and place importance on building, building and strengthening systems. And systems is, are the, the policies, the enabling environment. The conversation I had with Professor Turk when he was the former president of Slovenia, uh, which are these intangible uh, elements that must be in place at country level that uh, are resilient, that can withstand shocks and provide access to water and sanitation 
even for the most vulnerable, including those affected by humanitarian crisis. So building resilient and sustainable systems, getting beyond the emergency response is at the heart of this nexus. And of course, it's not uh, uh, an easy, it's not an easy, it's not an easy task. And I, I, I was uh, uh, looking uh, at some data uh, published by UNICEF and I was thinking, uh, um, uh, and I was trying to put it in real terms. Imagine a girl, because we all know that now most crises, humanitarian crises are protected anywhere between 17 and 26 years. I have a 17 year old daughter and I was thinking, imagine my daughter having been born into a conflict setting. She will be according to UNICEF 20 times more likely to die of diarrheal disease if under the age of five, then even from violence associated uh, with a conflict. As she grows, lack of access to wash will continue to affect her life in profound ways, including as she seeks ways to manage her menstruation indignity, risks violence in search for clean water. <coughs> By the time she's in her 20s, that's not yet my daughter, still living in such a context, she's likely to have been pregnant, potentially given birth in a clinic with no wash. And facing the same challenges her parents faced in keeping her safe from diseases as a baby. So we are committed to working on also humanitarian settings because we believe uh, that this is indispensable if we want to uphold the rights to water and sanitation, the human rights. So both human rights and humanitarian law are very clear in prohibiting the deliberate destruction of water and sanitation infrastructure, inter alia, this infrastructure. Human rights law provides the framework for ensuring the progressive realization of these rights. And these obligations, contrary to other human rights obligations, remain regardless of conflict or other crisis. There are human rights that can be put on hold during armed conflict, during crisis. Water and sanitation cannot. So it requires states to continually take steps towards ensuring these rights for everyone without discrimination, avoid retrogressive measures, and of course, ensuring accountability, I think is still important in times of crisis, and uh, there are many mechanisms out there in our partnership, uh, we have a mutual accountability mechanism. And many of our country partners, uh, as you might know, we have 71 uh, uh, country partners in the Global South. Many of them uh, face humanitarian crisis, well, in the whole of their country or in parts uh, of their, uh, their territory. And what we hear from them, what we see from them is an immense interest uh, 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 to make sure that we work with them across, uh, 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 across this nexus. Because what we also see, to go back to the beginning and I will end here, is that the problems are political. Uh, because as we all know, and you were mentioning it, Kelly, we have many technical solutions, etc. So we must go a little bit more upstream in order to address the political problems, to make sure that we have an integrated approach in order to ensure not only an immediate response to acute emergencies, but also long-term building forward better for more resilient and sustainable communities and societies. I will stop here and of course, I'll be happy to talk more uh, if time permits. Thank you. Great, Katerina, thank you. Thank you so much. And I think, yeah, that's I, I, that's really interesting, you know, framing because I think you're right that it's, um, yeah, it, it is this, 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 these linkages and how, um, I think, yeah, a lot of insights around how we can use partnership and mutual accountability um, as a way of, of um, you know, of carrying um, this work forward. So thank you very much um, for sharing, sharing those thoughts. Um, and, you know, now um, we're going to move to the third panelist, um, who is uh, Monica Ramos. Um, and Monica is the um, coordinator of the Global Wash Cluster. Um, Monica, let's see, are you, I'm not seeing your video yet. Are you there? There you are. Okay. <laughs> Great. Okay. Just want to see who I'm talking to. Um, and um, so, you know, I think, so we've heard kind of from, um, 
you know, from Katarina, who's working with, um, you know, 71, um, you know, uh, different uh, governments and also, um, you know, a multi-stakeholder platform. And of course, the Global Watch Cluster um, is also, you know, a mechanism um, that, that brings together, um, you know, predominantly, of course, with the humanitarian focus, but also many actors who are working um, also in, um, you know, development settings. So I think from your perspective, um, why do you think it's important to encourage the development actors to work in closer collaboration with the humanitarian um, watch actors to address these critical watch needs? Um, and maybe coming from your viewpoint, um, what, what recommendations do you have for maybe actors who sit more on the development side um, of, of the sector um, to be able to strengthen this collaboration? What would you like to see from development actors to be better partners for you? Over. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Dr. Turk. Thank you, Katarina. Thank you to the organizers and to all of you that are attending today. Um, definitely, I think that there's been so many great points already made, touching upon some of the points you made in the introduction, Kelly. I think that what we see, see on an, a yearly basis is just um, humanitarian crisis is reaching a peak. We, we see disease outbreaks, famine, extreme poverty, violence, conflict. So the list does go on, unfortunately. We have seen a, a huge increase in the reliance on humanitarian assistance. And as such, a lot of these humanitarian crises as well are becoming more protracted and it's really pushing humanitarian organizations to have to adapt to the increasing needs as well as adapt to a very changing operational environment. And also they're really struggling, we're all struggling to keep up with the frequency of the prolonged and complex emergencies. So I think in general, we've touched upon all of the, the kind of statistics and that we know around uh, fragile settings and, and what happens in terms of humanitarian appeals. And they think that what we really are feeling is an intense pressure. The humanitarian community really cannot do this alone. And the humanitarian wash sector within that really does need to have a, a collective way to address um, the global call to action that you were mentioning earlier in terms of shifting humanitarian aid to actually achieving the, the ambitious goals set out by the, by the development, um, or targets, excuse me, set out by the development goals. And really how we do that in terms of reducing risk, vulnerabilities, and the overall needs. So I think that in order to, to improve the way that we come together with our development counterparts, we really need to change the way that um, the humanitarian wash sector itself is set up. We need to become more versatile. We need to also be able to understand the spectrum and the range of the settings that we are trying to, to deliver operational responses in. Um, I think we definitely, it's time to get out of this idea of, of business as usual. I know we use this kind of key term in many different settings, but we really do need to change um, what we're doing and how we're doing. Otherwise, we will never be able to meet the volume uh, and, and the nature of the demand. And this really uh, comes to overcoming the, the silos and really how do we come together across the humanitarian and development divide, also bringing in the peace actors to really think about how we can maintain our commitment to the humanitarian imperative, but also how we can contribute to, to the greater um, you know, ambitions of, of, of development. And so I think we've, we've worked on a few of, of the areas that I looked at today and tomorrow has really been able to flesh that out when we develop the WASH Sectors Roadmap 20 to 25, advocating for engagement. So what we're doing today, I think is a, is a huge, great step forward to really look at how we can strengthen a resilient and a risk-informed WASH sector, not speaking humanitarian, not speaking development, but speaking WASH sector as a whole. How can we also develop diverse operational models? So you were mentioning that earlier, Kelly, and I know we'll be having some group work today to unpack that. But also what comes with that is really thinking about sustainable investments and strategic partnerships. So I hope that we can get into that today, as well as our common commitments. I think we've talked about the mutual commitments and where we all want to come from. I think ultimately what I hear everyone saying is we want to reinforce the wash sector. We want to be more resilient. We want to be more risk informed and we want to be prepared and particularly in fragile states. 
And that comes a lot with reinforcing um, and working with the capacities of our national, national governments and national counterparts in really being able to put them in the driver's seat to prepare for lead and coordinate more effective and predictable and high quality responses, whether they're happening in the humanitarian or development realm or in both all at the same time, which we know does happen. And lastly, I think it really does come down to sector financing, coming from a donor background, really knowing how investments are made, how do we work better with the private sector, and really how do we all contribute to really improving WASH service delivery across the board for all of those that, that are in need. So thank you, Kelly, and thanks to all. Great, Monica. Thanks. Thanks very much. And yeah, I think really, um, you know, taking away this idea that we're, you know, that we're one, um, yeah, one sector, one movement that's really working towards reducing um, risk, reducing vulnerability. And I think, you know, in the spirit of the Agenda for Humanity, really um, working towards um, ending need um, through this, um, you know, achieving the rights to to, to water and sanitation with with um, um, sustainable solution. So I, I know I'm, I'm uh, Tilo used the word discipline earlier. This is a hard one. I'm not a very good time manager, but I think this has been such a fantastic discussion. And I would really like to come back to um, each um, of our um, of our of our panelists um, just for really one final kind of takeaway advice. Like we're right now, I guess in some ways kind of like um, at the start of, of this journey that we're gonna go on for the next um, two days, um, really going into um, how can we work towards um, a practical implementation. And I, you know, I think we've got a good understanding of the problem. I think we're, you know, we're starting to have um, understanding the solutions um, that we have, the, the, the tools that we have um, within um, our different um, areas of work. Um, and so just maybe as kind of a final perspective from 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 each of you, um, maybe kind of going back through the same order. Um, you know, if you could kind of give us one takeaway, um, what do you really see as kind of the main opportunity that that we have um, to move forward um, this triple nexus agenda um, for water and sanitation? So um, maybe starting with uh, Dr. Turk. Well, I'd like to be very brief because my initial remarks were on, you know, among the longer ones. But you see, the, the, uh, there will be a need for campaigns and there will be a need for a variety of activities. And much has been done already, so I don't want to go into everything. Only to select one aspect which must not be neglected. And that is, I think it would be very wise to concentrate on the United Nations Security Council to see when the Council uh, considers reports relating to specific situations like, for example, Sahel and West Africa or other reports which are geographically defined. Uh, analyze how those reports are prepared. Talk to the Secretary General of the United Nations because these are his reports eventually and convince him that there has to be a WASH sector in the report which is which is brought to the Security Council regularly. You know, there are situations where water is such a fundamental problem that it must not be neglected because of some not new or emerging questions that are all there. This is always there and it has to be always in the reports and there has to be a pressure for the Council to, to, to speak about this and to guide both the representatives of the Secretary General for the region, but also for the UN system more generally. I think that that's a very important thing to do. Now, uh, in, and if the uh, Executive Director of UNICEF, Henrietta Four, was prepared to do some work with, with Antonio Guterres, I'm sure that he would listen. And I think that the work which was done through Water Under Fire report has gone a long way in that direction. You see, I'm not suggesting that this is the main thing or let alone the only thing, but it is an important thing. Think about it, think how you do it and do it. Great, Dr. Tech, thank you. Thank you so much. And I think you're, I mean, I completely agree. Um, and I think we, you know, we had some opportunities this past year through the um, UN Security Council meeting um, on um, children, 
um, in uh, armed conflict. And I think, you know, that, that it's absolutely right. And I think it's also, I mean, Katerina conversation that we've had that we need do need to be better um, in um, embedding um, things around water sanitation and hygiene through the different channels. And, you know, that we tend to, because we tend to be a technical sector, a lot of times our conversations are um, inside of our, of our group, but that this type of global action really requires um, that type of um, embeddedness within um, these bigger global um, agendas and different pillars of the of the UN system. So thank you um, very much um, for that strategic um, advice. Um, and Katerina, now maybe, you know, moving um, kind of to the same question to you, if you kind of, you know, speaking to the, 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 the group that we have here today, maybe kind of one advice or opportunity that you think we should um, look at in our um, discussions today and tomorrow. Over. Look, uh, honestly, I thought of three little uh, uh, things. Um, the importance of avoiding fragmentation, uh, uh, because uh, what we feel is that the fragmented approaches that separate development for humanita from humanitarian work have also re re resulted in fragmentation on how aid is distributed. So I think there is room for more work, and I think that in the discussions that we promote in SWA, um, uh, that we host on WASH Finance with Ministers of Finance and FIFIs and bilateral donors, I think that we need to bring the issues of coordination of funding in the development, humanitarian peace nexus. I think it seems a natural topic um, that we have not given attention to, and I think it would be a good thing. Another thing, in the context of COVID, we saw a, a surge in humanitarian pledging efforts with COVID-19, uh, the, the the, the UN system's COVID-19 humanitarian response plan has appeals for over $10 billion. I think that this is also a strategic opportunity for WASH. And finally, I cannot not bring again the topic of climate. We know this is an, a, a crucial year for climate action. We also know that the decisions that are made this year will likely affect life on Earth for decades to come, whether for good or for bad. And as I said before, if we do not tackle climate, uh, the numbers of people living in fragile contexts will increase dramatically. Uh, and of course, this brings us back to political will. And I think that also Professor Turk's proposal to engage with the UN Secretary General speaks to that. It is again political will. And I think that even at SWA, we can do more in reaching out because we have 81 governments around the table. So I think that raising also their awareness uh, to these matters, even to the the proposal that Professor Tuk just made, uh, it makes sense because I think that the pressure needs to come from different uh, sides. Over and thank you so much. Thanks very much, um, Katerina, for those um, three points. Um, Monica, now um, over to you. Thank you, Kelly. So just building upon, I think, really hearing the themes from Dr. Turk and Katerina collective voice. We really need to really stop thinking about humanitarian development and we need to think about people-centered and inclusive wash. This is what we're all trying to achieve with the work that we do and factoring how peace does influence that. So I really think that it, it's really kind of shifting the paradigm there and really thinking about how do we effectively reduce risk, reduce vulnerabilities and overall needs, knowing that, as Katharina said, it, it's increasing. It, you know, given what is happening contextually in our environment, th those, those issues are only magnifying. And then lastly, just the positioning. I really do hear Dr. Turk's point. I think we need to position the WASH sector. Today is great. We're a bunch of 86 excited and dedicated professionals in WASH, but we need to get this message out. We really need it to transcend across and beyond the WASH sector and really you know, put forward, and I think we do have it in all of our spirits and the way we want to work, a really united front, because I think that we are all struggling and we constantly see the, the risk and what's at 
stake. And so really it's, it's actually a call to action. I mean, the time is now, well, the time is probably passed, but I mean, now we really have to harness it and make sure that we, we use this momentum to move it forward and really put WASH in, in terms of all its linkages and, and, and how important it is into the center of these global level discussions. So hopefully we can get some momentum today as well as moving in tomorrow. Thank you so much for having me. Great, thank you um, very much um, to the three panelists. And I think in some ways it's a panel that doesn't, I don't think it requires a, a summary because I think each of, you know, each has really provided a, um, you know, kind of a conduit for, for the thinking that we're going to be taking forward over um, over the next coming days. I think maybe the main thing to say is um, is that I think we, we've we got a, um, I think we've got an ambitious uh, task ahead of us, but I but I think it's an essential one. Um, and I think as we as we're you know looking forward to this and and um, and yeah, kind of how we take it forward, I hope that everyone who's here today can 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 and what you've heard can find um, a way that you will be a critical part of this process and this solution. Because I think that in order to really achieve, as Monica said, this collective voice, we are all going to have to be working together in our, you know, whether we're, you know, working at a subnational level and, um, you know, working, um, at, you know, with communities that are, that are experiencing these problems or whether we're, um, you know, engaged in the member state deliberations with the UN Security Council. Our work is, is essential across all of these levels um, in terms of implementing the, the, the change that we want to see. So really, um, how have high expectations that we can come out of these two days and in this roadmap process that can help us take you know, a view ahead um, for the coming years so that we can really work together um, to make um, substantive and lasting change. So um, really thank you um, so much um, to the three panelists. I think this was really inspiring um, and insightful. Um, and now uh, Tilo, I guess, handing back um, over to you um, to, you know, guide us on um, the next steps of the journey. So thank, thank you very much um, and wishing everyone great um, rest of the workshop. So thank you. <laughs> thank you very, very much, uh, Kelly. And thank you to yeah all four of you for that discussion, for those inputs, for setting the scene in that way.